Um, so this is a question, I think this is a question from the audience. It may well be from, um, from somebody listening virtually. So is the ability to petition a parent when you're 21 going to change under the new administration? I'm 18, US born citizen, and I've heard I'll not be able to petition my mom when I turn 21. I've not heard, I've not, look, we know who is up for one of the positions, hates all immigration, right? Documented otherwise. One of the strongest stretches in American history is related to family, and that's one of the family-based things. So that's one of the last things that I sort of think that they will touch. But I mean, if we sort of, at some point, we should talk about the way the Immigration Act sort of came about quotas, because it's really about the last group in. And if you go all the way backwards, 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 it was the Irish, it was the Jews, right? Then it was the blacks in a different type of way in 1965 that incorporated them and sort of removed the quotas globally. But then what I think was really important that was said here is that individuals who come here legally pay taxes who are Indian nationals wind up waiting 10 or eight years to get a green card. It's not a question of will they get the green card, it's a question of way to get the green card. They pay taxes, local taxes, federal taxes, they live in our communities, their spouses cannot work, right? Their kids cannot work. So it's a dilemma that we have manufactured by having quotas that go back to the constraint of it's a pie sum sort of scenario. And the sooner we get out of the sort of pie sum and, and dividing people up by countries, which used to specifically relate to race, then we'll be in a better immigration system. If I could just add that, uh, right now the immigration laws, as is, have not changed. Uh, we're anticipating some changes, especially on the executive orders. Uh, but I do think that the best advice is to seek uh, legal advice. But I would say the bigger advice is that people need to hold their senators and others accountable. Uh, because we do, um, we are a divided country. And people should not just accept uh, bad policies. People need to organize and tell the stories and find new alliances. Uh, it is not over in terms of ruining our, our generous immigration laws where they do exist. People have to stand up and call for them to continue or even to be expanded, but at least to continue. And so that's where people need to stand up now. So quickly, I was, I was gonna add that as we stand up and the kind of messages that we put out, um, definitely the kind of cost benefit thing in, inside the Beltway conversation and even in many states uh, can, can sway the day. But we should not shy away from values. In fact, that, so one of the things that Trump said in one of the debates was you know, why do we have, why don't we sunset our immigration laws? Why do we have these things that are permanent? And that's probably something he's gonna try to do, to try to sunset some of these things. Go back to Lyndon Johnson's declaration as he signed the 1965 law in front of the Statue of Liberty, right? When he talked about the sins that this country had made in terms of putting these country-based quotas and enshrining family and contributions to our country as kind of the pillars that we still have. So that does not, and, and when he said contributions to our country, it wasn't high skills, right? So there's all this debate about, oh, well, we want high-skilled immigrants. Well, look at all the people working in the fields, right? Even so-called low skills, people are contributing enormously to this country. And so we need to go back to those values. And that's how we build some of these bridges because Surely we might be divided politically, but we have some really strong values in common. And we need to be able to reach down deep into that to then be able to convince people that what they are doing is, I would say, un-American. 